Amen. Well, hey, we are honored and excited to be with you this Memorial Day weekend as we bring a close to a series that I hope you've enjoyed and that I hope God has been able to stir some some stuff and awaken some things in your life. If you haven't made it every week, it's okay. I encourage you you to go online and watch those, especially last week. If you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to go watch that as we really talked about just how to receive the Holy Spirit and what that looks like in our life, because that's what we've been on the past few weeks is just kind of this journey. We started a journey together about a month ago, and and today we kind of bring that journey not to a close, but to its next steps. And and that's really our hopeful for today, as we've been looking over the past few weeks as to the questions of who is the Holy Spirit, what is his ministry in our life, what does it look like to walk with him, to be baptized in the Spirit? There are months' worth of things we could continue to talk about when it comes to the Holy Spirit from continuing his works and looking at the gifts that he gives and, and all of these things. But when I was praying this over the last couple of weeks of just kind of asking the Lord, how do we land this? Especially after last week, which we always look back in hindsight. It's like, that was probably the ending to the series. It was such a beautiful thing. It's just asking the Lord, what, 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 what's next? And what I felt him give me, uh, to be honest, it was one of those things I kind of argued with of like, that's too simple. Like, I don't want, I don't want to preach that. That's too simple. It's too, it's too elementary. But then I heard the Lord remind me that just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. And so sometimes even the simple needs to be respoken again and again and again. So this morning, that's what we want to talk about is is really answering the question, how can you learn to finish like you started when it comes to the journeys we're in? How many of you would admit that you are a great starter? Any good starters in the room? How many of you would admit you are not as good of a finisher? Anybody? (laughs) This is most of us. And there's all areas of life that we really struggle with this, and sometimes we feel better. I I found out this week, 89% of people do not finish their daily task list, okay? So all those of you that's lingering honeydew list at home, you're in the majority. It's okay. You're, you're, You're average, right? You're above average on this. When it comes to New Year's resolutions, it's 80% of people have stepped away or given up their New Year's resolution before February, I'm an overachiever, so I shoot for February 5th. Anybody else? Like, I'm going to at least be above average a little bit, right? When, when we, every time we've ever moved, and thankfully we will never have to move again, hopefully, and praise to God, um, I, I don't enjoy packing, but I like packing because I pack right. Anybody else? <laughs> it's one of those things. And I love my wife to death, but she gets distracted with shiny things. And what I mean by that is she'll, she'll be packing a box in a room and then she'll see something and think, well, that doesn't belong here. She'll take it into another room and then she'll start packing a box in that room. So then when I come along to start packing, what I'm really doing is finishing 30 halfway packed boxes that never got finished in the first place. And she's a great starter when it comes to packing. I just got to finish the box for her, right? We are better starters than finishers. There's something about the excitement of the beginning, right? But then it's the, it's the dredge, it's the, the, the grit and determination required in the middle where we struggle. We've been on a journey over the last weeks. And that journey led a lot of you to a moment last week of making a decision. A decision to this renewed calling, this renewed purpose of how you choose to live your life in the Holy Spirit, of how you choose to follow God and obey God and walk with God in discovering your purpose. The question is not, do you want to start the journey? What I felt the Lord impress on us for this morning is, do you want to finish the journey well? Do you want to be able to finish the journey like you started it, faithful and strong? Because anytime you take a step of faith, you can be assured of two things. One, the Lord has promised to be with you as you take that journey. Two, so is the enemy. (laughs) As assuredly as the Lord has promised to be with you in every step of your faithful journey, the enemy is right there too. So as we begin this journey, as we want to continue it, the question we have to ask is, I know the Lord will be with me, but I also know I'm going to be attacked So how do I fight against the attacks? How do I finish as well as I started? Faithful and strong. It's a common theme we see throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament in particular, is we would see these epistles, these letters written to churches. And a lot of times, almost every one of them has some moment in it where it has a place for encouragement. 
a challenge to persevere because the authors knew what the church has faced. As I said this morning, I wrestled because when I first started looking at it, it seemed too simple in my head. And so that was my battle as Lord. I don't, I don't want to preach something too simple. But as we dive into it this morning, I want to remind you that simple doesn't mean easy. You may not hear something this morning that you think, oh, I've never thought about that. But understand, sometimes power is not a new revelation. Power is in the simple practices that when implemented, help us finish just as good as we started. It's understanding those principles and implementing them in our life. So that's what we want to look at this morning. So we're going to look in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10 in particular. We're going to dive into this, but just so we understand where we start, let's kind of look at what Hebrews was. Hebrews, we we debate on who the author was, but Hebrews we know was a letter written to kind of a dual audience. It's written to this church, and the first argument that it was really largely written to Jews who became Christians. Those who were Jewish at birth and in the first part of their life who then became to know who Jesus was after his death and resurrection. And so now they're in this battle of the old life versus the new. Things changed, things shifted, beliefs were, came into existence that did not exist before. And so here you have these, these former Jews who are now Christians trying to live this life while being pulled back into the ritualism of Judaism. But there's also things you see pointed out that obviously show that it's for those who were the Gentiles, those who were not Jewish, who became Christians as well too. So you have this this dual audience in the letter. And the purpose of the letter is this. Although there was two audiences, they all had the same struggle. They were struggling to finish well. They were battling doubt. Anybody ever battled doubt? Just me? We're not honest this morning? It's okay. I'll be honest for you. We all struggle with doubt. Anybody struggle with confusion? Anybody in the last week ask God why? If not, maybe you weren't watching anything going on in our world. We battle confusion. Anyone ever battle community? Either feeling alone or feeling it's really hard to love difficult people, right? We battle community. Anybody ever have conflict in their life? Just me? If you don't have conflict in your life, you come up and preach, okay? Let's talk. I want to hear what you do. Maybe the reason you don't have conflict is because there's no one around you to have conflict with, and that's your struggle with community. You might ever struggle with unexpected change in their life. This is, this is the people here. The things they're battling with, this letter is, is a letter meant for one thing, and that is to encourage them to remain instead of return to their former life. So as we dive into it this morning, I want you to understand this. There are, there are Sundays when, when we might get a little heavier into the theology of it. We might get a little heavier into the Greek or, or some of those things that, that some of you would call deeper. I want you to hear today's message like the author wanted them to hear the book of Hebrews. This, this letter was not written to, to explain Greek verbiage. It was not written to explain even a lot of theological principles, a lot of the purpose of this book was to encourage them to remain in the life they've committed to with Jesus. A lot of the aspects of this letter were meant to simply encourage and inspire them to continue to say yes, to fight the temptation and to resist that thought of it would be easier just to go back to Judaism. It would be easier to go back to my pagan practices. It would be easier to stop giving, to stop serving, to stop worshiping, to sleep in on Sunday. It would be easier to do these things. The author knows that, and so he writes to encourage, to inspire, and to remind them of the life they're living. So let's look at this this morning. Starting in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 23, we're going to jump around a little bit in this letter The author writes, and so, dear brothers and sisters, he's coming off of a standpoint where he's walking through just the reminder of what Jesus has done and what that means for our life and the access now we have to the throne of God through prayer and and sacrifice. He says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. This is where we know he's talking to Jewish people for a moment because for them, they had the temple. And in the middle of the temple was the Holy of Holies. And this is a place that only the high priest could enter. That was the the place of direct access to God the Father. 
He's reminding them that because of the blood of Jesus, now you don't need a priest to go to the Lord for you. You don't need a God, a godly person to intercede on your behalf. Because of the blood of Jesus, you with confidence can enter into the area of most holies. You in the room, online, the original audience, because of your relationship with Jesus, can confidently directly go to God the Father. He says, you have to understand. So dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy places. They need to know this because that's the access, right? That's the access point to everything they need. Verse 23, let us then hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. We're gonna look at really three things that, that I think this letter points out that if we can learn these and how to do these, it will help us continue to finish like we started. And the first one is this, is that we have to learn how to embrace hope. We have to learn how to embrace hope. Not just have hope. He's very specific in his words here. He says, I want you to hold tightly without wavering and doubting back and forth to what? Not the worship experience you had, to the hope you've affirmed. He wants us to learn how to embrace hope. Hope is simply that joyful and confident belief we have in something that was promised. So if we have to learn how to embrace hope, let's start with what is the hope we are supposed to embrace? Well, let me start from the back. Let's start with what it's not. The hope you embrace is not you. <laughs> The hope he's talking about to embrace is not your self-confidence. It's not your ability to do good things. It's not your self-discipline. The hope he wants you to embrace is not me. It's not your pastor. It's not your leader. The hope he wants you to embrace that he's talking about, it's not even community. It's not your spouse. It's not a worship service. It's not a gift of the Holy Spirit. Those are all good things. It's good to have confidence in your walk with the Lord. It's good to have confidence in the people who stand up and speak, knowing that we want you to go home and look and test everything we say. It's good to have confidence and enjoy these worship experiences. It's good to have confidence and enjoy the gifts of the Holy Spirit that he's given because we're supposed to. It's good to enjoy and have confidence in your community. It's good to enjoy and have confidence in your relationship with your spouse. But those are not the foundation of your hope. If they are, maybe that's why your hope is failing. The hope he's talking about is only found in one thing. The hope he's talking about is found in the faithful promises of God. Promises that no matter what happens around us and what circumstances change, that we can look to and know those remain. So we remind ourselves of them constantly. I thought about this. As, as parents, you ever make a promise you wish you hadn't made as parents? So we, we like Disney. We're some of those crazy people. We like to go and we like to sweat to death and have all those fun things happen, right? Right. Um, but every time we go, when we first moved here, we, we had always gone on vacation, but when we go here, when we go now, we quickly learned that we can't, every time we go, we can't go like we're on vacation, right? We'll be broke. <laughs> like we won't be able to own a car to get there. Okay. And so we had to kind of teach our kids of, Hey, every time we come, you don't get to buy five gifts, right? So we're like, okay, so on special occasions, you can get a gift. Sound like a good plan, right? The problem is we didn't really specify what a special occasion meant. <laughs> so now every time we go, it's like, I mean, we got out of school early today. That's a special occasion, right? <laughs> so my grandparents are in town. That's a special occasion, right? It's my friend's birthday. They're not here, but that's got to be a special occasion, right? 
And it's funny to see how our children who sometimes forget to put on shoes before they walk out the door, never forget the promise we made them that on special occasions, you can buy something when we go to Disney. (laughs) They remember that. And the reminder of that promise gives them hope in those moments. So what is the hope we have? What are the promises that we have? Let's look real quickly. Romans 10, Romans 8, Romans 8, 10 through 12. Paul writes this. He says, and Christ lives within you. That's the first promise. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life. There's another promise. Because you have been made right with God. Another promise. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give you life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. What are the promises we find hope in? The presence of God through the Holy Spirit. He tells us right there, he says, as Christ lives within you, He ends it in verse 11 by saying, and he will give you life through your moral bodies by the same spirit living within you. What same spirit? The same spirit that resided in Jesus Christ is the same spirit of God that resides in you. That's a promise worth holding on to. That's a promise unchanging. That's a promise that is foundational for everything you want to do and need to do in a life of living for Jesus. It's to understand that I am never alone here. I am promised the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in my life. The same spirit that was upon Jesus, the son. I know I have this in me and I know this is upon me. The promise of Christ through the Holy Spirit in our life, the forgiveness of our sins. He says, when you were made right with God, you're not made right with God through your actions. Remember, don't put hope on yourself. If you're as flawed as I am, that's a failed position of hope, right? You put hope on the salvation of Jesus. What his cross and death and resurrection did for your sins. And that that, belief in that, is what made you right with him. That's a promise of assurance. The promise of a new life. A life lived now and forever. Honestly, that one right there is what gets us through difficult weeks like this past week. I'm not surprised by pain in our world anymore because I also know that this is not the end, (laughs) that there is a hope we have for a new life here and tomorrow. We don't grieve like those who have no hope when we lose friends to cancer. Why? Because we know life did not end at that day. Her life began anew in heaven with the Father. These are promises that define where our hope should stand. And I love that he says it like this. Back in our Hebrews passage, he says, hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. It means you've already professed this. This is where we know he's not speaking to those who are still discovering who God is. He's speaking to those who know Jesus, who have a relationship with Jesus and who are struggling today. He says, hold tightly without wavering to the hope, the confident expectation of what will come, something that you've already affirmed, something you've already confessed, professed, and believed. What I love about this and the way that we're going to kind of theme the rest of this as we go through it quickly is, we said at the beginning, when we take a step of faith, we can be assured of two things. One, God's presence with us, but the enemy's presence as well, too. His desire to to thwart God's plan for our life. His desire to stop us from pursuing the life God has for us. We call it spiritual warfare or spiritual attacks. And it's important to acknowledge them because we have to be ready for them and know how to defend against them. And what I love about this passage is everything we look at, we see the area of attack and we see how to defend against it. It's hidden in here if you look. He says, hold tightly without wavering. So what does that mean? It means that the way the enemy attacks your hope is always with doubt. He says, hold tightly to it so that he doesn't take it away. 
Hold tightly without wavering so that doubt doesn't slip in and make you get confused and frustrated and stop. If he encourages you to hold tightly without wavering, that means something's trying to take it away or shake it away. Something is going to come to try to make you believe that maybe what you believe isn't what you should believe. This is how the enemy is going to attack. He's going to try to get you to doubt. He's going to try to get you to be so frustrated that you begin to get shaky in your faith with the Lord. So we hold on. We embrace hope. He continues, verse 24 and 25. He said, let us also think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. First thing we do is that we learn to embrace hope. The second thing is we learn to embrace help. Anybody struggle accepting help in their life? Yeah, those of you with your hand up just don't want to admit it yet. I understand, it's okay. We struggle to accept help in our life. We struggle to battle this a lot of times. But understand this, the faster you can accept help, the further you'll go and still stand. The faster that you are willing to accept and acknowledge your need for help in your life, the further you'll go. The stronger you'll stand, the firmer you'll walk, and the more faithful you'll be. Because we need community. From the beginning, God looks and says a man was not designed to be alone, and he creates Eve, his perfect earthly companion. To the community we see in the Old Testament, the communities we see in the church in the New Testament, we are designed in this way. We're not designed to live this life alone. We're designed to live this life with people around us. There's a help that we need to embrace. When we look at the passage again, we see the same thing. We see the defense listed so that we can infer the attack. The defense is to motivate one another to good works, which means we're going to get discouraged, right? We're going to face weariness. We're going to want to stop doing the right thing. He says, motivate each other with love, acts of of love and good works. Let us not neglect meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another. The enemy always attacks community with division and discouragement. He's always going to attack a sense of community with division and discouragement. This is why he starts saying, motivate each other to acts of love and good works. Galatians 6, 9 reminds us, so let us not grow weary of doing what is good. It's okay to acknowledge that sometimes always doing what's right gets tiresome. Always choosing to do the right thing sometimes gets and grows weary because sometimes the right thing is not the easy thing. And we want to do the easy thing. When I'm stuck in traffic, the right thing is to pace, is patiently and peacefully take my hand off the horn and zip my mouth. <laughs> what I want to do, I'm not going to say. <laughs> so I get frustrated. And then when my kids are in the car, they call me out when I do it. <laughs> Dad, it's not nice to honk your horn. I know, baby. I just need to alert them to what they're doing wrong. It's fine. That's all it is. <laughs> It's just a way of saying hi. It gets hard sometimes and tiresome to keep doing the right thing. Partly because it's discouraging because most of the people around us aren't doing the right thing. So we feel discouraged. We feel like we're standing alone. Sometimes it gets really hard to keep loving difficult people. Amen. It gets very hard to keep loving you. You're right. (laughs) We are the difficult people. Someone didn't give up on you. When Jesus was carrying the cross, he didn't finally throw it off his shoulders and say, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. You people are frustrating. He kept it on his shoulders. He carried it. He died and he rose because it was the right thing to do. He didn't grow tired of loving you and your difficulty. So we're not supposed to grow tired of loving others. The way the enemy wants to do this is he's sown this lie into the church And he has made us mistaken something that I'm going to call sameness as oneness. We are called to be one. One Lord, one baptism, one faith. We are not called to be the same. We've forgotten that. So in our minds, we get this concept where if you don't look like me, talk like me, vote like me, act like me, we can't be one. 
It's not true. There is only one you. There is only one him. Our pursuit is to live the life he's called us to live. I'm not supposed to live your life. You're not supposed to live my life. You're called to live your life because that's what God created you to do, and I'm called to live mine. We're not supposed to be the same. The enemy wants you to believe that if you're not the same, you should not coexist together. It's not true. He calls us to be one under our salvation in Jesus. doesn't mean we're the same. The reason this lie matters is because this lie is desiring to divide us. That's why there's not one church. There's a whole fraction of different belief systems. Doesn't mean they're all wrong, but it's because we don't really know how to all get along in the same room together and have these agreements. So when I get mad because they don't do this right, I just go next door to the next church and hope they do. We don't have to be the same to walk as one in the Lord. We partner with churches that we don't agree with everything on as long as our foundation is true. Do you believe in one God, one salvation, one baptism? Amen, awesome. Then I don't care how loud you play your worship music. I don't care if you serve coffee in the auditorium. I don't care about this part. I care about the foundation of it, where your hope lies. And if our hope lies in the same place, we can be one even though we're not the same. And I don't have to allow the enemy to defy the church. This is where our hope stands. And so we have hope to hold on to community. Last, we have to learn how to embrace our yes. We're going to go through this quickly. Hebrews 10, 32 through 36. He says, think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful? <laughs> Which means they're, what do, they're not doing what now? They're not remaining faithful. It's like, think back to January 2 when you were really, really strong in the gym and your diet was really, really good, and you weren't on social media too much, and you weren't watching TV too much, and you weren't doing that, and you weren't doing that. Remember how good you were then? Think back to that day. Remember back to that moment. Think back to those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and you were beaten. Sometimes you helped others who were suffering in the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. For you knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need so that you will continue to do God's will. We have to learn how to embrace hope, how to embrace help, and how to embrace our yes. Remember the yes you made. <laughs> Remember the difference between when you say yes and when you don't. Because here's what happens, and I'll tell the story real quick. And when I was a sophomore in high school, we were at a summer camp with our church, you know, and it's that, it's that experience, right? The, the lights are a certain way and we're all hot and sweaty and tired and we're emotional. It's the end of the week and we've, we've all cried a lot. And we've heard a lot of truth spoken about the Lord. And, and I'll never forget, we were at Latham Springs uh, camp in Texas and they had this moment at the end of the service and it was this idea that if, if, if you maybe feel God calling you to ministry, come down front. And for some reason I went down front. And I said yes and had the pastor pray over me and we had this moment and then I went home. And a few days later, what did I begin to do? I don't know that I was really supposed to do that. Oh, my brother had just stepped into full-time ministry. He's a pastor as well too. I, I probably was just following his lead. Like, I, I don't think this is really what God wanted me to do. I was just caught up in the emotions. I was caught up in the moment. That's not really for me. And it wasn't until know, eight years later that I heard that call again. And then here we stand today. See, what happened is I, I said yes, and then I forgot my yes. <laughs> I said yes, and I allowed the attack of the enemy to steal the confidence I had. 
I allowed him to cause me to doubt. I didn't have accountability and community around me concerning that calling, so I stood alone where I was weak and vulnerable, and he attacked. And because of that, I wasted the next eight years not pursuing the yes God had placed in my life. He says, think back to when you first believed. Remember and embrace your yes. The enemy always attacks your obedience with distraction and frustration. He wants you to see and chase the shiny things that are over here. (laughs) He wants you to get frustrated because you said yes, and it's not going the way you thought it would go. I said yes to give, but I'm still struggling with my finances. So I should stop. I said yes to serve, but I feel taken advantage of. I don't feel like anybody's honoring and acknowledging me, so I'll just stop serving. I said yes to go to church, but no one's talked to me. I said yes to pursue my marriage, but they're not pursuing it the way that I am, so maybe I shouldn't do this. Every time we say yes to something good in our life that God's called us to, the enemy immediately is going to try to discourage you and frustrate you because your yes is dangerous to him. Because here's what you have to understand about the enemy. When you say yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he's lost the eternal battle. He can't touch that. It is sealed in heaven and secure. And so when you say yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he's lost the most important battle. So what does he have to do now? He has to find a new battle. If he can't take away your salvation, he'll try to frustrate your calling. He'll try to frustrate your community. He'll try to bring doubt and division into every area of your life. And for some of you, he's winning. He may have lost the eternal battle for your soul, but he is winning the earthly battle for your life because you have forgotten your yes because your hope is in the wrong things and you're walking through it alone. As assured as you can be that the Holy Spirit has promised to be with you in this journey, the enemy will be just around every corner. But stop giving him more credit than he has and deserves. He's not clever. (laughs) He's not creative. He's been doing the same thing since day one in the garden. His attacks have never changed. They are the exact same. Look at the pattern of history in our culture, in our world. His attacks have always been the same. That's good because we can anticipate them. When you say yes, he's going to make you doubt. He's going to try to isolate you. He's going to distract you from what God is calling you to do. So beware of the doubt. Beware of the temptation to be alone. And beware of the distractions that he will throw your way. That's the trick. That's what he wants. He cannot take away your salvation. But he can slow you down. So we're left with just this call to stand firm. This is how we're going to close. We're actually just going to close with this verse, and I want to pray over you. Hebrews 10, 39, he closes this passage with this verse. And what I love is this, is he, he makes this bold statement, but it's almost like a challenge for them to make the statement in return. And this is what he says. He says, but we, he's speaking on behalf of them as a community. But we, the Jews who became Christians, the Gentiles who became Christians, those who think they're perfect, those who don't, but we are not like those who turn away. That word turn away right there is this Greek word, hupostale. And this word hupostale is less about you changing your belief as it is this timid retreat So when he says we are not like those who turn away, he's not even necessarily saying we're not like those who stop believing. We're like those, we are not like those who stop living. We are not like those who in in a place of frustration and fear turn away because it's too hard. Because they're disappointed, they're confused, they're frustrated. He said we are not like those who turn away, who shrink back from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones those whose souls will be saved. He wants you to learn to finish like you started. 
strong and faithful. But it requires you to hold on to hope. It requires you to embrace help. It requires you, requires you to remember your yes. Because he remembers his. That song we sing, that God is our provider. Understand this, that the hope you have is the knowledge that as you take this journey, he will never leave you. In the form of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they will never leave you. The question is, will you leave them? Will you be like those who shrink back? Those who turn away and retreat? Or those who choose to stand firm in the adversity? Those who anticipate the attack of the enemy and they push back? Those who fight every bit of doubt with faith? Those who die fight every bit of distraction with focus and perseverance on the things of the Lord. Those who fight isolation by surrounding themselves with community. He says, we will not be like those who shrink back. I'm going to pray for you real quick and, and we're going to close. And I, I, I just want to, I want to pray these three things over you. These are three things that I pray for and ask God for every day. Because I know without these three, I will shrink back passion. Pray every day that God would renew my passion for him, my passion for my wife, my passion for my kids, and my passion for my calling. Because if that passion is lit, I will chase after it with veracity. I ask that he fill me with discipline. Discipline to not get distracted. Discipline to not waver. Discipline to not give the enemy a seat at my table, to not allow him any space in my life. And I pray that he give me joy. If I can remember the joy of what God has done in my life, why would I ever want a taste of anything else? So every day I pray for passion. I pray for discipline and I pray for joy because I want to be one of those who doesn't shrink back, but who stands firm and pushes forward in the faith that God has called me to. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the goodness of your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your strength and might. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit and that you would fill us with those three things. For those who are wavering and struggling, that you would fill them with a renewed passion. A renewed passion for you, that they would pursue you through prayer, the study of your word and meditation that you would renew their passion for the important relationships in their life, the passion that they are maybe wavering with with their spouse, the passion that they are wavering with for their calling. And I pray that you fill them with discipline, the discipline they need to stay strong, the discipline they need to not fall victim to the lies of the enemy, the discipline they need to not get distracted by the things that are not of you, but the discipline to stay the course. And I pray ultimately you fill them with joy. Because if we overflow with joy, then there is no room for the things of the enemy. Because our heart, our mind, our thought, and everything in us is focused on that of you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we adore you. We ask that you would help us to be of those who do not shrink back, but those who remain faithful and finish well. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And if our ministry has been a source of encouragement for you, let me encourage you to do two things. Number one, share it with a friend who needs hope. That would make a big difference in their life. Secondly, share it with us. We would love to hear your story. You can send us an email at amen at bridgechurchfl.com. And finally, if you'd like to partner with us financially as we bring hope both locally and around the world, you can do that directly through our website, bridgechurchfl.com forward slash give. And thank you for letting us be a part of your spiritual journey.